I just don't get what the big deal about Valentine's Day is. I mean, if you wanted to get yourself some chocolates, all you had to do was go down to the store and buy them. Like I did. It's so easy. Why wait around for someone to just show up and give them to you? In all my years of existence, not once has a single person ever given me any chocolate on Valentine's Day. And look at me. I'm doing just great. <sighs> Valentine's Day is just like any other old day for me. Which means that I need to get on to doing a manga review. But which one to choose? Let's see. Let's see. Which manga to cover and... Oh, there we go. Why not Clover? That's kind of a manga about someone just waiting around for someone else to give them something. Yeah, that could work with today's theme. Clover by Clamp was serialized in Ami from 1997 till 1999, when the magazine folded. This resulted in the manga being left unfinished. The edition of the manga I read was the 2020 Collector's Edition, published by Kondasha and translated by Rei Yoshimoto. The creators of Clover are a legendary mangaka collective known as Clamp. Currently composed of artists Sasuke Igarashi, Mokona, Subake Nekoi, and writer Nanase Okawa. Okawa served as lead scriptwriter for Clover, with Mokona serving as lead artist. Igarashi and Nekoi both served as assistants. Clamp is legendary, and the history of the collective is extensive. I'm just not going to be able to do justice to the importance that they had to the manga scene with this brief introduction. They definitely deserve a video of their own, but today, I'm going to try to keep it simple. Clamp originally started as a group of either 11 to 12 female artists. It depends on who you ask. These artists created manga for the doujinshi market in the mid-1980s. Now, before continuing, I think I should briefly explain just what a doujinshi is. And now, for a reading from the Webster's Dictionary. Today's word is doujinshi. Simply put, Dojinchi refers to self-published comics. Well, they don't have to just be exclusively comics. The term could also refer to self-published novels or video games. For the purposes of today's Weepster entry, we're going to be focusing on fan-made comics that typically borrow from already established franchises. However, there are also creators making original doujinshi works. These doujinshi are usually distributed at comic conventions, such as Comic Cat, which is a major convention that deserves a video of its own someday. These doujinshi works are allowed to be sold due to a legal gray area in Japan's copyright laws. Now, don't get me wrong. Not all publishers are pleased by these doujinshi works, but they typically don't move to take action against the creators of these works. And with that, we conclude our reading of the Weepster's Dictionary. Artist Mokana was born in Kyoto in 1968, while Tsubaki Nikoe and Satsuki Igarashi were both born in 1969 in Kyoto as well. As teenagers, the three attended the same school, 
and began drawing comics together. Nanase Okawa was born 1967 in Osaka and became friends with the other three artists after being introduced to them by another friend who had bought a comic made by Mokana. In college, Clant's membership was composed of a large group of friends and artists who would meet up and produce comics for the doujinshi market. Producing doujinshi for Captain Tsubasa and Saint Seiya. The group's official debut came about in 1989 with the manga RG Veda, which was serialized until 1996 in Wings Magazine. In 1990, their membership had decreased to seven, and then four not long after that. Clamp began to produce a large number of manga series throughout the 1990s and 2000s in a wide variety of genres. Some notable works include 1992's X, 1993's Magic Knight Ray Earth, 1996's Card Captor Sakura, and 2003's XXX Holic. These manga proved to be huge hits, and Clamp quickly cemented their importance within the manga scene, not just in Japan, but the U.S. as well. A number of their works have been published into English, garnering sales in the millions. A number of their manga have also been adapted into anime series, and they have provided character designs for a number of other notable anime, such as Code Geass. They continue to create manga today, and still do character designs, with their most recent project being the character designs for the anime Card Fight Vanguard Overdress. The story of Clover is set up into roughly two parts, with the first telling the story of Kazuhiko and Sue, and the second basically being a prequel that flushes out the story of the first part. The manga takes place in a dystopian future where certain individuals with extraordinary abilities, such as telekinesis and teleportation, are known as Clovers. Based on the powers of a clover, they are given a rank from 1 to 4 by the military and are then locked away from society by the government body known as the Wizards. The story centers around Sue, the only four-leaf clover, which makes her the strongest. The manga starts with one of the Wizards giving a former military officer named Kazuhiko a secret mission to escort Sue from her prison to a secret location. Once Kazuhiko gets Sue, he has one of his roommates, Ron, teleport them to that secret location. But as they are being transported, they are intercepted and have to make the rest of the journey on their own. Meanwhile, they are being chased down by special forces led by an old rival named Bowles. So, just where are Kazuhiko and Sue going? Also, why was Kazuhiko specifically chosen to escort Sue? What is the connection that the two share? To find out, you're just going to have to read the manga for yourself. Starting with the art, I absolutely loved it. It was incredibly striking, and I liked the overall aesthetic of the manga. There was this slightly cyberpunk slash steampunk dystopian look, but what I loved most about the aesthetic of the manga was how the artists incorporate natural objects within the designs of unnatural objects. Take, for instance, the large abundance of objects with wings. By incorporating something natural, like a wing, with an unnatural object, it made for a cool addition 
and made the design feel more unique. I also enjoyed the character designs because they fit in perfectly with the overall aesthetic of the world of Clover. The art had a minimalist look to it. The artists will typically only include what was absolutely necessary for a scene. Because of this minimalist approach to the manga, there results in there being lots of negative space in the backgrounds and on the pages, which added to the unique look of the manga. The panel layouts were also a big contributor to the striking look of this manga. The layouts were incredibly unique. A lot of the time, they appear disjointed and yet they work. The panel layouts may overlap each other and they will sometimes be framed within the negative space itself in a way that was unique. The overall framing of the panels are fantastic. There are interesting layouts and the framing can work to help create impactful and emotional moments within the narrative. There are also some truly great panel sequences found throughout the manga. Sequences such as Sue's wing transformation and this moment of Aura saying, I love you. There are also some breathtaking spreads found throughout. One final thing I wanted to mention in relation to panel sequencing is that there were a few moments in the manga where the panels were laid out in a way that presented the reader with an interesting contrast. Take for instance these pages that contrast Ron against Gingetsu, or these pages that contrast Aura against Sue. It was a neat addition to the art that adds to the narrative. Speaking of which, moving on to the story, it was good. Unfortunately, the manga is unfinished, leaving a number of mysteries unanswered, such as just who Bowles is, who the wizards are, as well as their plans. Even though those mysteries were left unanswered, the other mysteries in the manga were well executed. The manga slowly fed you information, flushing out the world, and it helped to keep me engaged with the story. The story concepts were also good. The Clover Project and the Wizards were incredibly interesting to me, and I wish we could have learned more. The three story arcs were also well executed. I enjoyed how the manga was set up, with the second arc going back in time to flush out the story of the first. Dialogue is sparse in the manga. It's quiet and slow. This isn't a bad thing, however. I enjoyed this aspect of the manga. The sparse dialogue leads to slow world building that kept me engaged in what was going on within the story. It kept me turning the pages, which is great. Examining the themes of the manga, there were some pretty universal themes, such as longing, loneliness, and the biggest one of all, love. The manga, in some terms, was also about being able to let someone go and moving on with your life. These are all some great themes and messages to have within a story and they were executed in a way that was enjoyable. A number of these aforementioned themes are revealed to us through the three songs found in the manga. Speaking of which, I loved how each song connected with the story arcs that they were featured in. The first song is about being whisked away in order to find happiness. The first arc of the manga was about Kazuhiko taking Sue somewhere far away. The second song was simply about love, and the second story arc was about Kazuhiko's relationship with Aura. Finally, the third song was about being reborn, and the third arc was about someone being reborn. The songs would be repeated over and over again within each arc in order to really drive home that arc's central theme. 
It was a great idea to use songs in this way. Examining the characters, they were great. Sue was a tragic and gentle soul. Kazuhiko was the cool, badass professional until the second half of the manga in which he was presented as a humorous and jovial individual. This change in his character in the second half of the manga makes sense within the context of the story and it helped to add complexity to his character. Gingetsu was a cold but ultimately caring individual. Aura was a beautiful and lovable character. And finally, Bowles was a fun character to watch with his intimidating playfulness. What I mean by this is that Bowles will toy with his victims as he's attacking them. Now on to the relationships in the manga. They were, um, well, okay, so the relationship between the characters of A and C was the most interesting in my opinion due to its complexity. C is torn over what's best for him and wanting to stay with A, while A is torn over what he wants and what he knows is best for C. Aura and Kazuhiko's relationship was good because of just how in love with each other they were. It's honestly beautiful. Where things get a bit uh, problematic is the relationship between Kazuhiko and Sue and the relationship between Gingetsu and Ron. Starting with the latter, we honestly didn't get much but it felt a bit uncomfortable with the implications that were joked about in the manga. Now, it's nothing concrete, but the implications are disturbing, considering the age gap between the two characters. As for Sue and Kazuhiko's relationship, it was even less clear to me, and the possible implications are also problematic due to the age gap. Now to reiterate, with these two relationships, it's personally not clear to me what exactly is going on between them in both cases. And I very well could be completely misreading it. Overall, the manga is highly striking and visually amazing. There is some truly fantastic sequencing and framing with panel layouts in the manga. I loved the overall aesthetics, especially the convergence of the natural with unnatural objects. Art was minimalist, typically only including what is absolutely necessary in the scene which added to the visually striking nature of the manga. The world building was slow, keeping me engaged with the story. I found it unique how the manga told its story, with the second part being a prequel to the first, flushing everything out. I also love the incorporation of the three songs within the story arcs. Finally, the relationships in the manga could be good, and a bit unsettling. A and C's relationship was interesting and Oro and Kazuhiko's relationship was beautiful. However, the implication of Ron and Gingetsu's relationship is problematic, as well as the relationship between Sue and Kazuhiko. But to reiterate, it wasn't entirely clear to me just what was going on with these two relationships. I could very well be completely misreading it. All of these factors considered, I'm going to have to give Clover by Clamp in 8 out of 10. And that's the video. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you agreed with what I had to say about Clover by Clamp. Unfortunately, since the manga is unfinished, it left a number of mysteries unsolved. And the ending of the manga is unsatisfactory because of this. This manga probably would have been a 9 if it had been finished, but in its current state, it's going to have to be an 8 out of 10. Anyway, I hope to see you on this channel again real soon.
Goodbye.